Welcome back everyone. You're here because you want the real deal when it comes to HIV information and we're ready to dive deep today into some really fascinating stuff. Yeah. We're talking about those rare cases where HIV's either been cured or at least controlled long term and what those cases might mean for you and for the future of HIV research. Yeah, and those cases are really intriguing. We're pulling information from all sorts of sources for this one. Scientific publications, medical journals, reports from big conferences. AIDSMAP.org especially has a lot of great details on these cases. And while they might not be typical, they do offer some potentially huge insights into HIV itself. Absolutely. So we'll be looking at confirmed cures, of course, but also instances where people have managed to keep the virus in check without needing constant medication. Huh. And it's important to remember right off the bat that these are exceptional cases. It's not the reality for most people living with HIV. Right. But by figuring out how these cases work, we can learn so much that could lead to new treatments and maybe even a wider cure down the line. So let's get into it. What kind of extraordinary cases are we talking about here? And what might they tell us about HIV? Well, the research breaks these outcomes down into three main categories. First, you've got people who were either cured or achieved long-term control after having a stem cell transplant. Then there are the post-treatment controllers. These folks can keep their viral loads super low, even after they stop taking their antiretroviral meds. Okay. And lastly, there are those incredibly rare individuals who just seem to control HIV naturally, like their own bodies do it without ever needing antiretroviral treatment. Fascinating. Let's start with those stem cell transplants. I know there's been some buzz about those. What's the crucial thing to understand about them? It's all about the context. These transplants weren't done primarily as an HIV treatment. They were actually needed to treat really serious cancers, like leukemia or lymphoma in people who also had HIV. You can see this pattern in a lot of the AIDSMAP.org reports. And here's the really interesting part about why these cases are so special. Most of them involve a rare genetic mutation called CCR5 Delta 32. CCR5 Delta 32, that's a mouthful. What exactly does that do to the virus? Okay, so imagine this. This mutation basically means the person's immune cells are missing a specific doorway. It's called the CCR5 co-receptor. And most HIV strains use this receptor to get into and infect immune cells like your CD4 cells. If that doorway is not there, HIV can't get in. Now this mutation is pretty rare, but if someone has two copies of it, they have a really strong natural resistance to HIV infection. Got it. So in these transplant cases, people with HIV receive stem cells from donors who had this double mutation, which essentially gave them a new HIV-resistant immune system. Is that right? Exactly. The idea is to swap out the recipient's immune system with cells from a donor who has that double CCR5 Delta 32 mutation and create a system that can resist HIV. The most famous case, and it's detailed on AIDSMAP.org, is Timothy Rhea Brown, the Berlin patient. Ah, yes, the Berlin patient. What <laughs> made his story so unique? So back in 2006, Timothy Ray Brown received two stem cell transplants for his leukemia, and his donor had that all-important double CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. He also went through some pretty intense chemo and full-body radiotherapy to wipe out his existing immune cells before getting the new ones. And here's the big thing for HIV research. He stopped taking his antiretroviral therapy during his first transplant, and his viral load never came back. They did tons of tests over the years and couldn't find any HIV that could actually replicate in his body. That's incredible. So he was considered cured. What does that mean for HIV research? Yeah, by December 2010, they started using the word cure for his case. He lived for another 14 years after the transplant with no signs of HIV coming back, and he became a big advocate for HIV cure research. Sadly, he passed away in 2020, but not from HIV. It was the leukemia that came back. His case was really groundbreaking, though. It showed that a cure was possible even if it was under these very specific circumstances. And there have been others like him, right? Oh, absolutely. You've probably heard of Adam Castiello, the London patient. He got a stem cell transplant in 2019 for Hodgkin lymphoma. And again, his donor had that natural resistance because of the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. 16 months after the transplant, his CD4 cells didn't have those CCR5 receptors anymore, so he stopped ARSE and has been controlling the virus without it for five years. No trace of HIV. Five years off Art E and still undetectable. That's pretty remarkable. It is. Then we have Mark Franca, the Dusseldorf patient, who had a transplant for leukemia in 2013. His donor also had the double CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, but he was more cautious and waited until 2018 to stop RT. After more than four years of testing, doctors declared him cured in February 2023. Wow. 
So are all these cases the same? Do they all involve that mutation? Well, there's also the New York patient. She's the first woman who was reported as cured using this method. Her case was announced in February 2022, and she received a slightly different type of transplant called a haplocord blood transplant back in 2017 for leukemia. It used umbilical cord blood with the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, but it was supplemented with cells from a relative who didn't have the mutation. And this is important because finding a perfect match with the mutation is really hard, especially for people of mixed race, because the mutation is more common in people of white European descent. She's been off RT for 14 months now with no HIV rebound, so it shows you how adaptable these techniques can be. It's interesting that they had to adjust the transplant method for her. Shows the challenges they face in finding the right donors for everyone. Definitely. And then there's Paul Edmonds, the City of Hope patient. His case was reported in July 2022, and you can find the details on AIDSMAP.org. He was the oldest at 63, had lived with HIV the longest 31 years, and had the lowest CD4 count they'd ever seen in these cure cases. He received a stem cell transplant for leukemia from a donor with the double CCR5 Delta 32 mutation stopped ART two years later, and hasn't had any trace of HIV for 17 months. His leukemia is in remission too, so even in long-term infection, this approach can work in certain situations. These stories are pretty amazing. Hmm. But you did say that all but one of these cases involved that CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. What was the exception? That would be Romold, who was initially called the Geneva patient. His case is really interesting because he went into HIV remission after a stem cell transplant in 2018, but the donor cells didn't have that double CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Before this case, everyone thought that mutation was absolutely necessary for remission after a transplant. Ramald had been living with HIV since 1990 and had it fully suppressed on IRT since 2005. He got the transplant to treat leukemia and afterward his original CD4 cells were completely gone, replaced by the donor cells. But here's the thing. He developed graft versus host disease, which is when the donor immune cells attack the recipient's body. To treat that, they used ruxolitinib, and this drug can also reduce the HIV reservoir. Think of the reservoir as like a hiding place for HIV in certain cells. So the drug he got for the graft versus host disease might have actually helped with the HIV remission, even without that special CCR5 mutation. It's a strong possibility. They did ultra-sensitive testing and couldn't find any HIV after the transplant. He even stopped treatment intentionally, and amazingly, there was no viral rebound for 54 months after he stopped. His HIV DNA levels just kept going down. His case is really raising some important new questions about how HIV remission might happen. It might not all be about the CCR5 mutation. This is all so hopeful, but I know there's a catch, right? Yeah, there is. Researchers are really careful to point out that these cases are super rare, and when they've tried to replicate these results in other people getting cancer treatment, it hasn't always worked. Stem cell transplants are risky, they're intense, and they're crazy expensive. Right now, they're only really an option when someone with HIV needs a transplant for a life-threatening cancer. It's not a cure for HIV in general. It just wouldn't be feasible for most people living with HIV around the world. So yeah, they're groundbreaking, but also very specific. That's a really important point to remember. Okay, so let's move on to the second category, those post-treatment controllers. What's so special about them? These are the people who, for different reasons, can keep their viral loads undetectable or really low even after they stop taking antiretroviral meds. And in a lot of these cases, but not all the common factor seems to be that they started RT extremely early in their infection, like within the first few weeks. The thinking is that this early intervention gives the immune system a chance to get a head start on the virus. It might lead to a smaller viral reservoir, that hidden pool of infected cells we talked about, and it could also help develop broadly neutralizing antibodies, which can recognize and neutralize a bunch of different HIV strains. So early treatment lets their immune system get a better handle on HIV from the start. Yeah, it seems like it. Take the French Visconti cohort, for example. There's a lot of info about them in the scientific literature. A 2022 report looked at 10 people, six men and four women who all started RT within three months of infection. They stopped treatment after at least a year and stayed undetectable without restarting. And get this, seven of them have now been undetectable for over 10 years. One person's been off treatment for a full 17 years. 17 years without treatment and still undetectable. That's mind blowing. It is. 
But the report also mentioned that nine other people in that Visconti cohort had times where their viral load was low but detectable after they stopped RT. And three of them had to start treatment again because their viral load went up. So even with really early treatment, it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to control HIV long term. Estimates suggest that maybe only one in nine or even less than one in 20 people treated super early will control HIV for at least a year off treatment. It's promising, but not a sure thing. So the odds aren't great. Are there any groups that might have better luck with this post-treatment control? Well, they think children who start R8 very early could be good candidates because they start treatment so soon after infection and they tend to have fewer of the effector memory T cells that HIV likes to hide in. Those are the cells that make up the Leon Reservoir. There's a case of a South African child that was first reported in 2017. They were born with HIV, started ART at two months old, and then stopped at one year old as part of a trial. In 2022, at 13 years old, they were still undetectable off RT. And here's the interesting part. They didn't have a strong typical immune response to HIV, but they did have strong activity in a gene that codes for PD-1. That's an immune checkpoint protein that can kind of force immune cells into a dormant state, basically keeping HIV hidden. So in their case, it wasn't a strong attack on the virus, but more like a way to keep it asleep. Exactly. There was another study that looked at five South African boys who controlled HIV, even though they didn't always stick to their art ever after birth. Their HIV was sensitive to type 1 interferon, and it could replicate really well. This might mean that there are gender differences in how infants control HIV. Girls make more type 1 interferon during pregnancy, which could make their baby's HIV less sensitive to it. There's also been a report about a child in Texas who started treatment within two days of being born, stopped at 13 months, and was still undetectable three years later. They had very low levels of HIV DNA sometimes, but their RNA was undetectable. These cases really highlight the potential benefits of super early treatment. Those cases in children are fascinating, but I remember reading about cases where people gained control without that early intervention too, like the Buenos Aires patient. Mm -hmm. What was so special about her? The Buenos Aires patient is a truly incredible case. She wasn't diagnosed until 1996 and didn't get early treatment at all. In fact, when she was diagnosed, she had a really low CD4 count and was already sick with an AIDS-related illness. Her viral load was super high. She had trouble sticking to her meds at first, but eventually her viral load became undetectable with ARP. And then in 2007, she stopped treatment because of side effects. When they reported her case in 2021, she'd been off ARP for at least 12 years with an undetectable viral load. Wow. They did a ton of tests and couldn't find any replication competent HIV DNA in billions of her white blood cells. And here's the craziest part, she even lost her antibodies to HIV. She became HIV negative, which is almost unheard of for controllers. Now she does have a genetic variant called HLA-D57, which can slow down HIV progression, but it didn't stop her from getting really sick at first. Her case is still a bit of a mystery, but it shows you that sometimes the body can achieve amazing control, even when you don't expect it. That's amazing to actually lose the antibodies. What about the Barcelona woman? I remember her story being unique too. Yeah, so she was diagnosed during acute HIV infection and in a clinical trial, she got immune modulating drugs along with ART. But she was the only one out of 20 people in the trial who was able to control HIV long-term for over 15 years off RT. So we don't know for sure if those extra drugs were the key. Like the Buenos Aires patient, she had a pretty typical initial infection and her CD4 cells were vulnerable to HIV, but her CD8 T cells and natural killer cells were really good at fighting HIV. So even if the extra therapy helped her strong immune responses, might hold clues about how to trigger similar control in others. So it sounds like there are lots of reasons why someone might become a post-treatment controller and we're still trying to figure it all out. Exactly. A big part of HIV cure research now is figuring out those mechanisms, whether it's early treatment leading to a smaller reservoir or specific immune responses or even genetic factors. The goal is to learn how to make this happen in way more people, not just those who are diagnosed and treated right away. Okay, so that brings us to the third category, HIV control without ever needing antiretroviral treatment. This one sounds like the rarest of them all. It is. We're talking about people who can control HIV naturally without any meds. They're generally classified as viramic controllers who have low but detectable viral loads between 50 and 2,000 copies, or elite controllers whose viral loads are undetectable in their blood even though the virus is still somewhere in their body. 
And within the elite controllers, you've got the exceptional elite controllers. These are the people whose immune systems seem to have gotten rid of all the intact viral material. Wow. It's like this. Viramic controllers have a little bit of virus that their bodies keep under control. Elite controllers have suppressed the virus so much that standard pests can't even detect it. And exceptional elite controllers seem to have cleared the virus completely, although this is incredibly rare. So how many people fall into each of these categories? Viremic controllers aren't that common. In the US and UK, it's less than 4% of people with HIV. But a study in South Africa and Zambia found a way higher number around 13%, and most of them were women. So there could be some gender differences there that need more research. Elite controllers are even less common. And the exceptional elite controllers, there are only about nine confirmed cases in the whole world. That's how rare they are. Nine in the whole world. That's incredible. Tell me about some of these exceptional cases. What makes them so special? One of the best known is Laureen Willenberg from California. She was diagnosed back in 1992 and has had a high CD4 count and an undetectable viral load ever since with only one small blip. Researchers couldn't find any replication competent HIV in her immune cells in 2011. Her immune response is interesting. Her CD8 cells have a really strong and specific response to the parts of HIV that don't change much, the ones that are essential for the virus to survive. Some of her immune cells have bits of HIV DNA, which shows she was infected, but no intact replication capable virus. So her immune system basically disarmed the virus in a very specific way. That's what it looks like. Then there's the Esperanza patient from Argentina. She was diagnosed in 2013 and only took RT for six months during her pregnancy in 2020 to protect her baby. But she's never needed treatment otherwise and has never had a detectable viral load in nine years. Similar to Lorene Willenberg, they couldn't find any replication competent HIV DNA in her blood or placental cells. And what's really interesting is that her partner had a high viral load. So her control seems to be entirely because of her own immune system. You also mentioned an Australian man. Oh, right. His case made people think he might have actually cleared his infection all on his own, but he had a really unusual combination of things going on. He had a defective virus, was missing one of his CCR5 co-receptor genes, and had characteristics of a slow progressor. These factors might have given his body more time to develop a really strong CD8 and CD4 response to HIV, which is what researchers are trying to replicate in others. So, yeah, it's unique, but it shows us that there are multiple things that can affect how HIV progresses. It really shows you the different ways the body can deal with HIV, even if those extreme cases are really rare. So what's the takeaway here for people listening? What should they understand about these exceptional controllers? The main thing is that both elite and post-treatment controllers are giving us really valuable clues about how the immune system can suppress or even get rid of HIV. Studying their unique responses is super important for developing new therapies that could one day help so to sum it all up, what are the big takeaways from all these extraordinary cases we've talked about today? The most important thing to remember is that while we don't have a cure for HIV that works for everyone, yet these different cases of cure and long-term control are showing us some amazing ways the immune system can fight HIV. The stem cell transplant approach has led to some confirmed cures, but it's still a really specific and risky procedure that's only really an option for people with cancer who need a transplant. Post-treatment control and elite control are rare, but researchers are studying them like crazy to figure out what's going on with their immune systems and how they can suppress the virus without beds. And even though this research is focused on these unusual cases, it's still important for the broader HIV community, right? Absolutely. Learning about the genetic mutations, the early treatment strategies, and the unique immune responses in these cases can point us in the right direction for future research and for developing better treatments that will help more people. So for everyone listening who wants good, solid information about HIV, what should they take away from all this? The research on these amazing cases shows that scientists are dedicated to finding a cure and better treatments for HIV. These stories definitely give us hope, but it's crucial to remember that for most people living with HIV today, the best way to stay healthy and prevent transmission is to consistently take antiretroviral therapy. But the knowledge we're gaining from these unique individuals is changing how we understand HIV and could lead to some big breakthroughs in the future. That's a great point. So as we wrap up today's deep dive, here's something for you to think about. We've talked about genetic factors about starting treatment super early and about specialized immune responses. Which of those do you think holds the most promise for future research and treatments that can help a much larger group of people? It's definitely worth thinking about and staying informed on. Check out resources like AIDSMAP.org and talk to your healthcare providers to stay up to date. Thanks for joining us today.